Um, great, okay, it's very nice to be here. So, um, I guess one of the main problems in the wider kind of reuse and synthesis of archaeological evidence is that you simply can't get at the data or the research findings. And I think whilst a lot of the kind of discussion around the public use of archaeology is around kind of cultural heritage and narratives, um, there's lots of people out there who aren't archaeologists, like ecologists and sociologists and um, other academics who I'm sure would do fantastic things with a type of data and I and others create. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, access to um, outputs, publications, um, access to data, and then um, access to the kind of research um, procedures and methods behind creating that data. So, I mean, there's many reasons why we should all be adopting open research practices in archaeology. Um, archaeology is obviously destructive, so once we've excavated and that has gone, you know, there's no way to, to re record. Um, many archaeologists, particularly in the UK, are not within academia, so they can't often access um, publications because they're behind paywalls. So, many of my colleagues um, who work on exactly the same material are in commercial archaeology companies and they can't pay to access the synthesis that I'm doing on their material. Of course, lots of research funders now um, mandate um, making your um, data and your research outputs um, open, so if you're funded by them, then you'll need to do that. And of course, the only way that we can make archaeological um, analysis reproducible is to make all of our data and methods available. There's no way to go and sample the same site again because it's gone. So we really need to make sure as much is out there and available as possible. So in terms of open access, there's been a lot of work on a subject in archaeology, particularly by Doug's, Doug Rox McQueen. So there's a fantastic website with a database of um, open access journals. Um, and there's been a kind of, I guess, gradual movement over the last 10 years to provide more open access publication venues. So we have a number of, let's call them gold, publication places where you essentially pay an article processing charge and your um, article will be um, open access under CCBY license forever. So some of these are kind of low cost options, so things like Open Quaternary, um, Journal of Computer Applications and Archaeology, uh, published by um, Ubiquity Press, who have a £400 APC and a one in a very sustainable scholar-led way. We're increasingly having more commercial publishers setting up pure OA journals, such as Star, which will have a higher APC. Um, but there's a growing number of options out there, and there's lots of exciting journals in countries in Eastern Europe and Central Europe, which are moving towards full open access which is great, but there's much less movement within the kind of, I guess, top tier Anglo-American style journals. So what we do have is a large number of hybrid journals where you can pay a fee to have your article open access, but many of the articles in there will still be behind a paywall. So at least if you have research funding, you can pay for this. But of course, if you don't have research funding, you can't pay and so you're then behind a paywall still and will suffer kind of imbalances. And of course, the APCs are very high. So um, what's that one? Archaeological and Anthropological Sciences is £2,080 to make your article open access. And there's no clarity as to what these APCs, so article processing charges, are. And lots of these journals are being told that they have to set a high APC to kind of retain... Um, journal brand and be seen as a high quality journal so they have to charge a competitive charge and it's not a it's not a free market because we can't choose where to publish really it's where who's going to accept so this is a big problem and it's not sustainable and one of the key things on the horizon is this thing called plan s and i've forgotten what the s stands for again sudden i think anyway so it was launched in um, autumn 2018 by um, a science coalition in Europe. So it's uh, research funders from 12 different countries who've come together and set out a kind of outline for where they want research 
um, funded research outputs to be. So by 2021, any research funded by one of the 12 um, signet countries has to meet these requirements. So the key things is that um, hybrid journals are being um, phased out. Um, hmm. You need, <laughs> but you can you can publish in closed access journals if there's a zero um, embargo on your postprint. So that is okay for some journals, such as CUP journals. Um, but it's basically calling for a move towards gold open access publication, which has big problems for lots of society run journals such as things like medieval archaeology, uh, proceedings of a prehistoric society, um, Britannia, where a learned society gets um, income from publishing that journal. So if that income source goes, lots of the scholarly um, functions that that learned society currently offers need to be funded elsewhere. Anyway, so this is a big uh, challenge at the moment, so it'll be interesting to see how many publishers in Europe react to us. But one option, um, which I'm involved in, is moving towards more scholar-led consortia type publishing. So one quick example is the Open Library of Humanities, which is um, a charitable publishers run by academics at Birkbeck University in the UK. And they're funded by a global um, consortium of universities who all pay a small amount of funding, so about £2,000 a year, so a lot less than um, many journal subscription packages. And then that means that anyone can publish in these journals without paying an APC, which is fantastic for scholars in the humanities and the social sciences, where there simply isn't the funding available to pay £2,000 an article. Um, so it currently hosts um, 26 journals, um, which is great, and I edit a journal called TRAJ, so the Theoretical Roman Archaeology Journal. So we they essentially host um, new journals, so we made an application to turn the Theoretical Roman Archaeology Conference proceedings into an open access journal. Um, they accepted our application, so we now publish through um, OLH. Um, so we can publish 13 articles a year, there's no APCs for the um, authors, so postgraduates, ECRs, anyone without a huge funding grant can actually make their research open access and others can utilise it. And interestingly, um, in anthropology, there a few of the big journals are pursuing a similar kind of consortium approach, so I think there, there's a news of a deal with um, Bergwin publishers whereby they all kind of come together to host a fully open access series of journals but sharing infrastructure and editors because of course there's all costs behind the publishing. So to me one now to open data, um, as anyone who was in the session on Thursday, which um, David organised with Courtney, um, there's lots of fantastic big projects across um, the world um, putting money into digital um, research infrastructure such as um, the ADS and the Ariadne project. Um, so there's very large data archives that you can use to archive your data and make <coughs> it available. The problem is many, I guess, individual researchers simply don't know how to archive their data properly, don't have money to do that, or maybe don't see the kind of use or in kind of usefulness of making their data available. So. Um, as an archaeobotanist, I'm very interested in using other people's archaeobotanical data. Mm -hmm. And in trying to synthesise this, I've spent far too much time <laughs> um, typing in numbers into spreadsheets or databases, um, but simply because it's, the data is horribly published in various monographs and PDFs and obscure places. So I wanted to see how much data is actually being made available. So the largest other study that I know of was conducted by Ben Marwick and Susan Pillar Birch in 2018. So they looked at articles in the journal, in several journals, so Archaeological Science, Archaeometry, Journal Field Archaeology, etc. And they were looking at Lithics data and basically found 53% of 48 articles did make their primary data available, which means 47% didn't. 
Then I emailed authors to say, can I have your data? So the no is yellow and clearly most people said no or I can't find it or I'm still working on it. So um, I spent some time reading um, any articles that published primary RK botanical data over the last 10 years and so not, I mean counts of seeds and that's a very widely accepted data standard in archaeobotany. So what we do is we take a sample from one context, we count seeds, two species, we identify them and then what a lot of people do is take that data and somehow crunch it into summary data by phase or by site um, which is useful for interpretation and analysis but it is not useful to other researchers trying to do new analysis. So basically I went through every single article, so about 239, and said, okay, is this kind of data available to me and in what form? So basically the red bars are no, that data is not available. So, and that's the highest category across many journals, so Vegetation History and Archaeobotany, which is our subdisciplinary kind of main journal, 50% um, of journals did not have articles, did not have their data. PNAS, only three articles, but none of them had their raw data, which is ridiculous. Um, PLOS One, also <laughs> surprising, and um, Quaternary International. Yeah, so there's a lot of articles being published, which are the main reports of that assemblage. They're claiming new research findings, but they're not providing their data. And there's only one article which has put its data in a repository out of 239. So something's clearly not kind of percolating. Um, people are sharing other types of data. It's often um, per, summed per site per phase, summed per site, or they share the graph, but not the data. Um, or the supplementary data tables have disappeared. So it should be there, but somehow it isn't. Um, why are people not doing this? Well, why are archaeobotanists not doing this? Um, there's a big lack of training in archiving data. At no point in postgraduate training was I told or encouraged to share my data or in what form. Um, should I do it as a CSV file or should I just make it into a PDF? Um, who knows? Um, often specialists have to publish their data set in the site monograph because that's what the excavation director wants. So you're then kind of stuck between trying to push out journal articles but being told that you have to put your data in the monograph, so then you're kind of conflicted. We don't really think about future reuse um, until you do it and then you realise how much of a pain it is. Um, it might be someone that's stopping you, such as a heritage agency or a developer or your pre PI doesn't want you to. Um, peer reviewers often are, aren't asked about data availability and they are increasingly in kind of cross-field journals like Nature and Science, but in kind of journal work logical science, you're not asked. Hmm. Um, cost, or no, some places are free, so lots of universities now have data archives which are free for now in some cases. And finally, um, if you do make your data available, you're not given any credit, which is a big problem. So to come on to my final point, we also need open methods, because otherwise there's no way to test what others have done, um, or kind of build on it and make research and synthesis better. So I also read 107 synthesis articles using archaeobotanical data over the last 10 years in 20 journals and basically said, okay, aren't they just citing their data? So not even aren't they making it available, is the code available? Are oh, it's never a citation. And um, I think it's about 23% overall do not cite their data. So the main article in my kind of sub-research field, which found these major patterns in plant food consumption in Roman Britain has zero data citations or site lists so there's no way you can do that without doing the whole process of data collection again and then you wouldn't even know if you have the same sites because and yes I could ask the author but you know at some point they are going to leave academia be uncontactable and then what was the point of all of that research funding anyway I'll stop funding. um <laughs> And also, over time, um, there's no real... Well, and there's a bit of improvement in data citation, which is good, but there's still a lack of citations. And it's an interesting thought that lots of the citations, well, a reasonable number are in supplementary data, which means you don't get the citation link on Google Scholar. 
So even if someone cites your data paper, it doesn't help with your page index or your citation count and you can't trace your citation links. And that's without even thinking about things like um, access to methods, you know, how many correspondence analysis plots do we see where we have no idea how the data reduction or the categorization worked. Um, there's a few papers now making code available, which is great. Um, so one my favourite example is, is this paper by Alan Parahani, who I think is at Nevada. So this is a pretty typical archaeobotanical primary data article and his data is all available, but in mentally data, boo, but never mind. Um, code is there, so, and that is all lovely. So um, I guess in my own work, I've learned a lot from speaking to people who are not archaeologists. So um, we, ha we have, in the UK, a new organisation called the UK Reproducibility Network, which has nodes in different universities. So we have one now in Oxford, where I talk a lot to psychologists, um, social anthropologists who are doing wonderful things. And then there's also, of course, the Centre for Open Science in the US, which is really great for bringing people together. And there's, I think these kind of things could have really big implications for archaeology, like preprints are just kind of catching on, but would hugely um, speed up the research process. But I think most journals don't have preprint policies yet. And then also things like registered reports. I mean, so much of archaeological publishing comes down to did you find something new or early or exciting in your assemblage, which doesn't reward people who are just doing very good work. <laughs> so um, what a registered report does is you say your research design and how it fits in the kind of research um, agenda. You submit that to a journal, may, um, based on the quality of your questions and your design, may say, yes, I'm going to publish the outcoming paper. So it, if you get negative results or you don't find the earliest seed or the latest seed or whatever, they still publish it, which is great. So it takes away this kind of gaming of just finding sexy things. <laughs> so I'm going to stop talking now, but in conclusion, there are big moves coming towards open access, which are great, but have lots of power inequalities and challenges, which we need to think through as a discipline. Um, and we're still stuck on prestige journals, despite the fact that most institutions are signatories to DORA it doesn't seem to be making effect. We need to teach postgraduates and undergraduates about research data and that CSV files are great and PDFs are bad mm -hmm. and there's a lot of exciting open research approaches coming through which will have big impacts and if you want to come learn more there's this really exciting conference taking place in Oxford in March. Great, thank you. Thank you.